Hi everyone, it's Sarah. Welcome to my channel. Today I wanted to film in honour of Women in Translation Month some of my recommendations for books by women in translation and that's translation from other languages into English because we know that the literary world is very Anglocentric. Um, and yeah, um, I, I thought I didn't really want to do like a an in-depth discussion about loads because I think I find it, I don't like to watch videos where people recommend loads and loads of books and it's like bombarding you so I just picked a few specific ones um, but also the other reason I didn't want to film a really in-depth video with loads of recommendations is because it's really hot today in Scotland, um, for Scotland I mean it's 23 degrees, um, heat is relative, um, we're not used to, well I suppose 23 is not that bad, um, that's kind of like average summer day but the humidity is horrific, like I've never known anywhere like Scotland for humidity because it's wild windy outside and raining and yet I'm just a, an absolute ball of sweat. Maybe that's just like my condition and it's not the same for everyone else but like it feels awful and I don't want to open the window because it'll be too noisy because like I said it's wild windy outside. But anyway without further ado I will get into some of the books that I recommend you might like in Women in Translation Month which is running for the whole of August um, or just in general I feel like we should always be reading more um, authors in translation because like I said the literary world is very Anglo-centric and we tend to sort of put English literature on a pedestal and there is good stuff out there that doesn't necessarily get voice it deserves so let's get into it. So the first book I'm going to start with is a German classic. Um, I don't often have that many recommendations of German books that I can give to people who don't speak German because if I'm going to read a book that was originally written in the German language I'm going to read it in German um, and I don't want to love a book, recommend it to somebody and the translation maybe doesn't do it justice and then yeah so I, I don't tend to recommend a lot of German books um, but I'm reading this particular book um, multiple times because I'm doing my dissertation on it and I have to read it in English. Well, I don't have to, but I have to quote in my dissertation in English. So it's just easier to read the English edition and quote from that rather than do my own translations. But anyway, that book is, like I said, a German classic and it's Cassandra by Crystal Wolf. Um, this is a Greek myth retelling. We know they're having a moment right now, but Krista, the OG. Um, and this is a retelling of, like, like I said, the myth of Cassandra, who was the daughter of King of Troy at the time of the Trojan War, can't remember his name, um, but she was cursed with the gift of prophecy so she could foresee things but this curse meant that nobody would understand, nobody would believe her, sorry, um, and she foresaw a lot of things, um, predicted a lot of things such as the Trojan War and nobody listened to her and look what happened. Um, so I think this book is I'm gonna put it down. Um, I think it's best enjoyed with a bit of context. I think it's quite, you have to be careful when you're like completing the main character of a book with the author because that's not always the case, but I think it is sometimes. And in this case, I think it's really obvious that um, Krista Wolf sees herself as the character of Cassandra. So Krista Wolf's a really interesting character. Um, well, was a really interesting like author character you know just had a, a fascinating life so she grew up in what's now modern day Poland and lived under the Nazi regime and then moved to East Germany to live under and contribute towards a socialist society after so it dawned on her like the horrors of um, Nazism and what that had done to people and her trying to reconcile her um, role in that like that she was complicit she was only a child but she was still sort of indirectly complicit in that and her parents and like the generation above her were directly complicit in that and her move to socialism was a way of well to her there was no alternative to um a capitalist society that could produce the horrors of 
Nazism and socialism was the, the only alternative for her. So I think it's best understood with that context, um, but also um, it was obviously heavily censored at the time of publication because this is an allegorical novel and it is a very thinly veiled criticism of the East German um, regime. It's not, don't go into it expecting like the typical socialism is bad because Krista Wolf truly believes that socialism is the way to be, um, but she didn't like the direction that the, um, the DDR, the German Democratic Republic was heading. Um, she saw them as on like a course to their own destruction and she she could foresee the collapse of this republic based on the way that socialism was heading in the country and that sort of like once power sort of obstructs what you initially set out to do which is what quite often happened in like east german socialist societies would be moving more towards um communism and then you would just end up with essentially a dictatorship um, and she's very critical of that aspect um so yeah I, I think it's clear that she sees herself as the the character of cassandra and the german democratic republic is represented as as troy um but it also has alongside that um like a real feminist element to it and it's not just in that it's giving Cassandra a voice and it's just being like, look at all these men who won't listen to this woman. But also she really criticises like neoliberal feminism um, that was sort of rising at the time. I mean, like I said earlier that there was, to her, there was no alternative to socialism and particularly in the UK at that time, Thatcher was very much pushing that infamous, there is no alternative to neoliberalism. So she's really, criticising neoliberal feminism and what we would now consider to be like girl boss culture I guess like lean in feminism and just really suggesting that true equality isn't going to come from striving for exactly what men are doing and we need to completely rewrite history to achieve equality because there will always be oppression under that society that the patriarchy has been creating for millennia so she's using Troy as I guess a metaphor to just say well look at all the destruction and suffering that patriarchy has caused over all these years we don't want that that's not feminism that's not equality that's not going to end oppression and yeah I think that's a really um interesting thing to read about from something that was published I'm not sure who mentioned when it was published it was published in the 1980s um like I said um heavily censored but we've got now this is the like the text as it is supposed to be um so yeah poetic prose beautiful writing a fascinating character I think I like reading about Krista Wolf more than I like reading her books but I think her books are still really worthwhile reading and I think it's um, something especially if you're interested in like all the Greek myth retellings so like the Madeleine Miller and Natalie Haynes um, you really need to um, look into Crystal Warp she also has another retelling called Medea which I haven't read but that's a, a later one I think that was published maybe in like the 2000s but yeah Cassandra is a really good place to start if you're unfamiliar with women in translation now as I waffled on about um, Cassandra for too long. I'm just going to do like a rapid quick fire of these three books because they're all from Charco Press which are a really cool indie publisher based in Edinburgh and they publish mostly um, Latinx authors in translation so like North Central South American authors but they also have recently expanded to publish works by their translators um, like original works in the English language that's very exciting but the three books I have are um, Die My Love by Ariana Harvitz and this is translated from Spanish by Sarah Moses and Carolina Orloff. Um, this is a story about a new mother who has moved with her husband 
I think her husband's French and she's from Argentina um, but she lives in like a really secluded part of the French countryside with her husband and her child and her husband's family live like sort of nearby and this is a really claustrophobic and sinister account of her descent into what seems like it is postpartum psychosis and um, it's really um really scary to read puts you on edge um definitely like a, a real um psychological book um and yeah i i love reading anything about um sort of fraught relationships between mothers and their children so yeah loved this one um the next one i have is fish soup by margarita garcia Rabayo, and that is translated from the spanish by charlotte coombe this is a it's two novellas punctuated by a collection of short stories they're all very bleak um, but also darkly funny and and mostly set i think most of them are set on the caribbean coast of colombia there might be some that aren't set there but like primarily towns and villages in colombia and it's a lot about um stagnation and just longing for escape and the protagonist really feeling disillusioned with not just the country that they're living in and that they grew up in but also disillusioned with their place outside of it so some of these characters will have moved to other countries such as the US and they're just trying to reconcile their place within the world and yeah it's um the best short story collection I've ever read so i would definitely recommend that i think this is my favorite book that i've read so far from charco press and the final one i have is um the adventures of china iron by gabriela cabotson camara and this is translated oh sorry by fiona mcintosh and yona mcintyre and this is an inversion of a famous Argentinian epic and um, the tale of Martin Fierro who is um, a gaucho just who goes off on these um, various adventures and this is a subversion of that poem um, following his long-suffering wife China and she goes on her own adventure in this novel so she befriends a Scottish woman called Liz it's a historical fiction so it's set sort of at the time when the British Empire was just starting to um, to enter Argentina and start to brutalise it. So it does feature a lot of um, commentary on colonialism and um, just how awful um, the British Empire was and what that has done to Argentina. But also um, it's a very hopeful novel because this is a queer love story between China and Liz. So it's a real like queer romp through the pampas of Argentina where they go off on this adventure with beautiful, rich descriptions of all the flora and fauna. And yeah, I think this is a change from what I've read from Charco, which tends to be on the bleaker side. This definitely has its bleak moments, but I think it offers a lot more hope and yeah, a really beautiful queer love story. The next book I'm going to recommend is Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata and this is translated from Japanese by Jinni Tapley Takamori. I'm going to recommend this not because I think you won't have heard of it or because I think it needs any more um, people talking about it but because I think if you haven't read this yet then you probably your ideas of what this is and what this is supposed to represent are probably wrong because I think this has been marketed appallingly. Um, I think it's it's racist and um, the way it's been marketed and I think that it completely misses the point of the book so I thought to illustrate some of the reasons why I think it's <laughs> racist and misses the point and um, I'll read you some of the blurbs which are it starts with like irresistibly quirky which just like again missing a point like it's not a quirky book um hilarious I couldn't put it down and I don't really think it is funny um I think that's quite strange that anyone would find it funny um as intoxicating as sake mojito we don't love to see that um sally rini says it's exhilaratingly weird and funny i don't agree um 
Vogue say it's brilliant, witty and sweet and brilliant and witty but is it sweet? I don't think so, I think that's leaning into ableism which we'll talk about in a bit. Observer calls it gloriously nutty. Um, what else is there? A deadpan gem. That's weird, like the Daily Mail is probably the um, most like true to what the book is, like it is quite deadpan I suppose. Um, not like the Daily Mail to have a rational take on anything. Um, but the one that really just makes me like want to just like curl up in a ball is a Times one that calls it quirky, memorable, it could only be Japanese. Like, oh, come on, like you would never say that about other countries. Like it's just feeding into that, oh, Japan's so weird kind of thing. And I just, I think it's awful and it needs to stop. But anyway, <laughs> the reason that those quotes are ranging from like not quite getting it to um, like racist are because this is the story of Keiko who is in her 30s and she works part time in a convenience store while everyone else around her tells her that she needs to aspire to be more, she needs to either find a career or find a husband because it's not acceptable that she is still in this part time job. Um, there's a quote I've written down that I think really sort of encapsulates the book um, and what it's supposed, what you're supposed to do. I think you're supposed to question what you think of as normal and explore how society is the thing that's weird um, and not like the story itself isn't a weird thing. It's like the expectations of society that are weird. So this quote from the book says, when something was strange, everyone thought they had the right to come stomping into your life and figure out why. And that's exactly what people do with Keiko. Like nobody can accept that she's happy with the life she has um, because they can't imagine that by eschewing like societal expectations, you could be happy. Um, so yeah, it's really like, like they are the weird ones. I don't see why so many people are having problems sort of figuring that out. Um, there's a bit at the beginning of the book in the opening pages where Keiko is a child and her and her classmates come across a dead bird on the floor and her classmates are all distraught by seeing this dead bird and Keiko says well why don't we eat it and everyone's like no you can't do that. And she's like why not we eat like chicken why can't we eat this bird and it's a real look at all these like arbitrary nonsensical rules that society enforces on you and how if you're like I think it's quite problematic to say that everybody who's like portrayed in a book is a, who is a bit weird is autistic um I think that Keiko is autistically coded um but yeah she just can't she can't grasp these like I said nonsensical rules like we we don't we're not supposed to see Keiko as weird because she's showing us that these rules are completely arbitrary and they make no sense especially when you consider that she is working at the convenience store the reason she's so happy at the convenience store is because it's so structured and she can go into work and know exactly how to behave because there are these rules that she can understand they're firm and fast rules like she's going to have pretty much the same routine every day nothing really out of the ordinary is going to happen and I think it really explores although not explicitly it never says like the story never says that Keiko is autistic so I think you have to be really careful about putting that label on her but I think you could definitely see this as an exploration of autistic masking and how how crushing society can be on people who don't conform to its expectations and how unforgiving it is to those people and how society creates this sort of set of circumstances that make autistic people and people who just don't want to conform to um how they're told they should live and um, how it makes them right to like abuse and to um, 
be taken advantage of and yeah it really opened my eyes this book as an autistic person I felt very validated by it and yeah it really does make you think like who are the weird people like it's just like neurotypicals who are just going about their lives doing exactly what society and it's like weird sort of rules that someone's just made up as like what's acceptable um like they're just happy to go about that without questioning it so yeah i thought it was really empowering to um members of the um neurodiverse community and i think that if you've read this book and you were tempted to call it quirky or weird um maybe have a sit and think about why that is because i think it's brilliant for a lot of reasons but not because it's weird next i have tender is the flesh which is um by agustina Pastrica and translated from spanish by sophie hughes this is a book that i wouldn't recommend to everybody it's very gory very graphic features a lot of body horror um and i think i've put a content warning on there for for sexual abuse as well so i would say i'd say check the content warnings anyway because um, of child death as well because child death is very like a, a prominent theme and um, i would say check the content warnings because there are a few and like i said it's not going to be for everybody because it's like horrific um this is a story um out of argentina which looks at a dystopian society where humans can no longer eat animals because of some disease um, and so they're taken to um, factory farming human beings so essentially legalised cannibalism and we follow Marcos who is a worker in this um, meat processing plant um, it doesn't it never calls the like the humans who are farmed for meat it's like a taboo to call them human you call them something else and I can't remember exactly what it is um, but yeah it's a at a very surface level it's like a polemic on factory farming and you could say that anything that is happening in this book and um, that's happening to human beings is happening to other animals so it is essentially like sort of advocating for veganism but i think more than that it's looking at the way society is structured and sort of makes you question um like which human beings are going to be designated the roles of being eaten and which humans get to to eat these um other human beings um so it's sort of created like a two-tier society um and yeah the exploration of that is really interesting and also touches a lot about um government control because there is sort of a rumor throughout the book that maybe this disease isn't real and this is just a way of controlling the population so again it like feeds into this idea of like which humans are the ones that we're gonna farm for meat and which ones are the ones that get to exist as human beings so yeah i thought that was um really interesting horror um and yeah i enjoyed that one although like i said very gory goes into quite graphic detail about what happens in the farms where they're farming human meat and there is just a scene that will like be scorched into my memory forever like the end of the first part of the book is just like just made my heart stop which is like oh my god um yeah horrific so would recommend that but recommend going into it knowing that you're going to be reading something really fucked up next i have a couple of Fitzgerald editions books to show you i'm not going to talk too much about these two because they're sort of quite well known um books and they've been talked about quite a lot on youtube the first one is hurricane season by fernanda melchior and this is translated also by sophie hughes who translated tender as the flesh um this is um a piece of Mexican fiction and it is a torrent of text so this I think in total has eight paragraphs in it so it's just like this long long stream of text and her sentences can go on for like a full page like once you are in 
this book like you cannot get out of it and that's really a reflection of um these characters lives because it's showing a small impoverished town in mexico and how so many of these people who live there are trapped by their circumstances there's a lot of um exploration of poverty and violence of misogyny and machismo um it starts with the murder of a character called the witch who is an outcast living in this like kind of like haunted like supposedly haunted like really creepy house um the witch is found dead and a group of children find the witch um dead in the town and then we get stories from lots of different characters who were in some way connected to the witch and each story takes you closer and closer to uncovering what happened to the witch um very brutal um the criticisms i've seen of this are that it's very violent and unnecessarily violent i don't agree and i've read interviews with fernanda melchor who said no it's not like over the top like this is actually happening and um, people are living like this and yeah i think it's um a really powerful book and I'm reading her second work in translation at the moment called Paradise and that is equally as um, intense but I really love her writing and I think Sophie Hughes is a brilliant translator. I think she's really captured um, the story well and I don't know how she's managed to do such a good job of it. It's it's brilliant. Um, it must have been such a task to undertake to translate uh, Fernando Melchor's work. And the second book I'm going to recommend from Fitzgerald, though I don't have a copy of, but that's Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Takabzuk, and that's translated from Polish by Jennifer Croft. Um, brilliant writing, love Olga Takabzuk as a writer, she's fantastic. Um, Drive Your Plough is hard to categorise, um, I'd say it's like quite um, you maybe call it a noir um, or like an eco thriller I've seen it um, described as and that's the story of um, an elderly woman called Janina who keeps discovering animals dead um, in like the remote Polish village where she lives and she's trying to tell people that um, there's something out there killing them and um, nobody is listening to her and then as the novel progresses men um, are found dead who have been in some way like associated with animal killings themselves um, and it's about her not being believed and um, like the isolation that she experiences and um, I thought she was really brilliantly done as an older protagonist because she's very spiky but you just can't help but love her and yeah I just I really I think initially I, I rated it quite low um, and I was just like oh that was fine the ending was quite predictable I kind of saw where that was going but then the more I thought about it the more I was like you know I really like that book and the writing's brilliant and it had a lot to say on um just the way humans interact with the natural world so I think that's a very accessible one um way more than like hurricane season's quite impenetrable where i think drive your plow is a bit more accessible and easy to get into so the final book i'm going to recommend before this video just becomes um horrendously long is three apples fell from the sky and this is by narina abgayan and translated by lisa c hayden it's written in Russian but the author is Armenian and this is set in a remote Armenian village and the reason I've chosen to end on this book is because unlike some of the others that I've um, recommended this is just a very heartwarming um, cosy read I would say it's set in a remote village in Armenia and I think the time period was very vague I don't really have a grasp on like when it was set um but it's just following the lives of multiple generations of um people in this armenian village um lots of different families and their trials and tribulations 
and their romances and yeah it's just very cozy and there are some like horrible things that happen like there are like earthquakes and like natural disasters and famines and you know people just going through like generally like hard times in their lives but it's written with real hope and tenderness and while I don't think it's anything like particularly groundbreaking like it's not like the best piece of fiction you're ever going to read I think if you're looking for something that's just like you can curl up with um, and just really fall into the story and the stakes not be too high and the themes it's dealing with not be too sort of hard hitting I think this is a really good one I um, thoroughly enjoyed it and I think I might try and reread that one um, I think it's more of an autumn read to be honest but I just thought I'd throw it in here anyway because it's a book in translation that I really enjoyed so now that I am even sweatier than when I started I'm gonna end the video here on these recommendations so let me know in the comments if there are any books by women in translation that you would recommend and let me know if you'd like to see another part of this video um I would be definitely up for filming something at, at some point because I read a lot in translation I'd say probably about 50% of what I read is not originally published in English so yeah let me know and thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again soon bye